and audible okay good thank you yes. so i'm going to start my timer right now so thank you nobonita i, I don't i have not seen you so i i'm presume um you are still listening to us um uh the case presented i think um, it is it is really uh, uh, it's not surprising that everybody has voted for the adrenal one but um, um we could have um, we could have asked i uh, have a few other questions regarding this but my topic is approach to your case of hyponatremia if we have time and if there are any question and answers then maybe i can delve with what should be the baseline uh, uh, 8 am cortisol which should be the cut off for diagnosing um, ad additions or adrenal insufficiency so approach to a case of hyponatremia so i'll have to be quick because this is a very big chapter it is the commonest electrolyte abnormality and it's a very big chapter i don't think i'll be able to do this justice in 15 minutes but i'll try my best it has been associated with increase in mortality and hospital stay what is the definition by a chemical definition serum sodium less than 135 so let us be very clear clean and simple 135 there are no pathognomonic clinical feature of hyponatremia you cannot say this is due to hyponatremia you cannot say there is no pathognomonic clinical feature mm -hmm. most of the time the symptoms are non specific in nature and may overlap with the symptoms of associated comorbid conditions symptomatic patients almost all of them have um, a sodium of uh, less than 120 <laughs> patients with plasma sodium more than 125 usually don't have symptoms which usually occurs with hyponatremia if a patient is severely symptomatic but the sodium is more than 125 double check the sodium level because the the, the result might be wrong or you have to look at other pathologies so sodium one say for example somebody having sodium of 126 and is very drowsy it is not due to the hyponatremia so more than 125 um, and severe symptoms look at other causes so when the initial approach first is the patient very unwell then the patient needs treatment first so is the patient very unwell so is the airway um, uh, um, you know abc airway breathing circulation all those are needed now previous records from the patient's note was there any previous history of hyponatremia when your hospital records of uh, hyponatremia old notes that plays that really um, gives us a very good clue because sometimes some patients have been running a so sodium of 124 125 for a good few months and suddenly they become unwell and the sodium level is 122 and you think that this is new it isn't it has been there for the last few months so you have to look at other causes so that's why previous records are very important you have to you have to really strive to get them now is there any history of volume loss so moment i get this sodium report i do ask this first because there is a tendency for all of us is to to straight away jump into siadh that should not be the case siadh is a diagnosis of exclusion you have to look for other causes so look for the common causes so common things occur commonly is there any history of volume loss a poor intake was just yesterday i had a lady with a sodium of 101 but um, with a history of stroke and not being cared for by the family clearly there was um, poor intake and there was volume loss clinically as well so history of volume loss history of headache so i'm hinting at subdural is there any history of falls so again hinting at subdural headache might also mean subarachnoid hemorrhage or any brain tumors is your weight loss that indicate malignancy drug history commonly thiazide group not the loop diuretics thiazide diuretics antipsychotics anticonvulsants they are the common offending um, um, agents now in this covid era it has become more important to ask about steroid because many patients um, were diagnosed with covid admitted to hospital and some of them are on tapering dose of steroids sent home they don't taper it they carry on and suddenly something happens the steroid is stopped i've had a few patients who have landed in trouble so now when you have taken this history now you assess the volume status however it is very important to note that this i have taken from the uh, european um, um, association for the endocrinology 
from the European Journal of Endocrinology guideline for the hyponatremia, that the sensitivity and specificity of assessing volume status is quite low, potentially leading to misclassification if you use it early on in the diagnostic tree. I will come to that in the diagnostic tree. So the volume status comes later on in the diagnostic tree. More often than not, that's what they are saying, that the, you are unable, unless it is barn door, um, the, the volume status um, does, uh, is not assessed correctly. So you have to exclude one of the common uh, reasons for admissions is hyperglycemia. So high blood sugars will cause low sodium. This is not pseudo hyponatremia and pseudo hyponatremia lipids and proteins cause hyponatremia. That's, that's problem with the assessment in blood sugar being high leading to low sodium is not pseudo hyponatremia. It is true hyponatremia because the solute, the glucose pushes it out. So the corrected sodium can be measured is sodium plus 2.4 into glucose uh, milligram minus 100 divided by 100. So that will be correct. So I'll give an example. So for every 100 milligram increase in glucose, you will get a 2.4 millimole increase in sodium. So somebody having glucose of 500, you would expect 2.4 into 5 is around about 12.5. So you get a 12.5 lower sodium level. Now the classification based on biochemical severity. So mild, 130 to 135. Moderate is this and severe is this. Now symptoms, this is important. So moderately severe symptoms is nausea without vomiting, confusion, headache. Severe symptoms, vomiting, deep somnolence, seizures, and coma. Okay, severe symptoms. This is important, the classification based on symptoms. Now, you know about the hyponatremia, but 9.9 .9 times out of 10, we don't have any history. So if you don't have any history, we have to assume this is chronic hyponatremia. So based on volume status, is the patient hypervolumic, euvolumic, or you think it's overloaded? This I will come in a little bit of time. So non, so hypotonic and non-hypotonic, I will come to that in a minute. So non-hypotonic, hypotonic hyponatremia with decreased extracellular fluid volume. So this might sound a little bit confusing, ladies and gentlemen, but I will clarify it when I go into the algorithm tree. So this non-hypotonic hyponatremia, you have to remember the commonest one is hyperglycemia. Leave that out, then the common ones are uh, sodium loss or plain dehydration, diuretics, and then SIADH. So here you are losing the sodium. So you are losing the sodium, so you're hypotonic hyponatremia, and you're losing volume also. So hypotonic hyponatremia with decrease in extracellular fluid volume. Here, there is increase in the extracellular fluid volume in overloaded states. And here, SIADH, where the patient appears to be euvolumic, that there's no overload or no dehydration. Now, a few points. Diuretics, it's not very simple. It's not that the diuretics just kick out the sodium, cause dehydration, that is why there is sodium. No, there is subsequent vasopressin release. Rather than weight loss, it has been seen in many cases that thiazide diuretics may increase body weight due to polydipsia. That plays an important role in the pathogenesis of hyponatremia. And it may induce the release of vasopressin um, 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 and increase the collecting duct response to vasopressin. The loop diuretics, on the other hand, they limit the kidney's ability to concentrate urine. So contrary to popular belief, thiazide diuretics are the one which cause hyponatremia more and loop diuretics are not responsible for most cases of diuretic-induced hyponatremia. In fact, loop diuretics can be used as treatment for hypotonic hyponatremia uh, uh, with, with, uh, in euvolumic state as well. So thiazide diuretic is the culprit, not the loop diuretic. Now, if you look at the primary adrenal insufficiency, which our case here um, has been highlighted, um, Aldosterone deficiency leads to renal loss. 
and that causes reduced extracellular fluid volume that leads to hyponatremia. And that might be the presenting feature. And I've seen several cases, and I'm sure a lot of the um, audience uh, delegates and the faculty have seen as well. Now, hypothyroidism. Now, again, contrary to popular belief, hypothyroidism very rarely causes hyponatremia. And you cannot put somebody having TSH of more than 100 and having severe hyponatremia, you cannot say that is the cause of hyponatremia because it only rarely causes clinically significant hyponatremia. Sodium decreases by 0.14 for 10 minutes. So if the TSH goes by 100, your sodium will reduce by 1.4. So it is not contrary to popular belief. So uh, I'm mindful of the time. So the criteria for SIADH, I will just skip now. So there are essential criteria of which you have to remember that the patient has to be euvolumic. You have to have low serum osmolality, high urine osmolality, more than 100. Now, causes of SIDH, there are plenty. Again, for, uh, for sake of time, I'm gonna skip it because I wanted to concentrate a little bit more on this. So when you've got somebody with hyponatremia presenting to you, you first, you first see, is there any hyperglycemia? If there is hyperglycemia, then that might explain the hyponatremia. Now, urine osmolality everywhere uh, in the guidelines is given, but it is not readily available. Only one or two hospitals in Calcutta have it. So if you have the urine osmolality uh, available, then you use it. But most of the time it is not available. So no point in pursuing this. So if it is not available, you do the urine spot sodium concentration. Now, if that is, you do it, even if the patient is on diuretics, because that might still give you some clue. So urine spot sodium, if it is less than 30, then here the volume assessment comes into the picture. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, most of the guidelines, they don't have the volume assessment tree up here they commit further down so that the mistakes are less. So urine sodium less than 30, you have expanded ECF clinically, that means it's overloaded state. You have got dehydrated clinically, that means there is GI fluid loss or poor oral intake. So that's very clear. If the urine spot sodium is more than 30, then either the diuretic is there if somebody on diuretics have got urea, um, uh, urine spot sodium less than 30, think about this. If urine spot sodium is more than 30, think about diuretics, but there isn't any diuretic and there is no kidney disease. Is the patient overloaded? Uh, sorry, is the patient um, um, dehydrated or is the patient euvolumic? So urine sodium more than 30, patient is hypovolumic, Think about primary adrenal insufficiency. This is the common, common amongst this. No, I cannot find any overload and dehydration. Then you think about SIADH, not before that. So emergency management, and this is very crucial because I am mindful that I've got any, another two minutes, so I won't delve into the chronic management. There is no time. So the emergency management, this is very important that a lot of mistakes happen. So if you have got severe symptoms, which I've enumerated earlier, 150 ml of 3% hypertonic saline over 20 minutes. So we are used to giving 100 ml of 3% saline over four hours, six hours, fearing um, osmotic demyelination. But the guideline actually says that 150 ml of 3% saline over 20 minutes, recheck after 20 minutes while you're repeating the infusion again. So this may be repeated until symptoms improve or sodium increase by five millimoles. What the guidelines are saying that if anybody has got severe symptoms, if the sodium comes up by five millimoles, that should correct the symptoms of severity. By 10 millimoles, definitely correct. If it's not corrected, if you increase by 10, then you have to look for other causes. So evidence suggests that 100 ml of IV 3% saline, if you give over 20 minutes, it will raise sodium by two to four millimoles. We know that we should not raise it by more than 10 millimoles. If there is no improvement after rise of one, five millimole, look for other causes. Further attempts to be made to increase it again, further by giving 3%. But 
once symptoms improve, you stop it. Either if the symptoms improve or sodium goes up by more than 10. So I'm mindful um, uh, of the time. So I'm going to skip the rest of it and go straight uh, to the end of the summary that this is a common problem. I have highlighted the algorithm as to how you go about uh, getting to the diagnosis. It should not be just volume assessment. That's the mistake we make. It should be a combination of bioclinical and biochemical tests. There is a change of practice. Why I've written that? Because we give 3% saline in severe cases very slowly. We have to give it over 20 minutes with the aim of getting it up by five millimoles quickly, because that's how you will uh, reduce the mortality and mobility. Now, the care with Tolvatan, I did not have time to act. So I'm sorry, I had to cut short the presentation for, 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 for uh, time constraints. So I'm stopping sharing right now. Good night. <laughs>